It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Donald Spivey, one of the most distinguished professors and scholars we are fortunate enough to have at the University of Miami. And in fact, introducing Don is a little daunting because if I were to do full justice to his achievements, uh, I sort of envision us being here at 11 o'clock with me saying, thank you for listening to the first part of the introduction. Uh, so to avoid that, I'm going to summarize drastically. First of all, nine books. From 1978, School for the New Slavery, Black Industrial Education, 1868 to 1950, through 2012's widely acclaimed, If You Were Only White, The Life of Leroy Satchel Page, and on through several more books to the one he will be discussing tonight. We could do a whole year of faculty book talks with Don as the sole presenter. <laughs> While remaining focus on African American history, Don's books cover an impressive range of subjects, including education, music history, sports history, and in many cases, how these spilled over into political history. On top of the books, there are various articles and other scholarly publications, and he also has a presence as a public inter uh, intellectual with TV and radio appearances, among other activities. And it, do I, am I right in remembering that there's a Hollywood option on the Satchel Page book? <laughs> so, you know, uh, we could only dream. Um, with all this work, it is hardly surprising that he has won the Provost Award for Scholarly Activity, among many other awards. Now, uh, with all the scholarly work, you might think maybe he's spending all his time on research and as a teacher he's a dud. But that's not true either. Uh, he's a great teacher, as shown by the Faculty Senate Award for Outstanding Teaching he received and by the popularity of his courses. Uh, particularly, of course, he's uh, anchored for many years on the 60s, which uh, attracts lots of students um, uh, and sort of gets the enrollments uh, you might get in a, uh, a required biology class. So for a history class or an interdisciplinary class, it's pretty impressive. He's also done outstanding service, and here I want to add a personal note. Uh, the history department in the early 1990s uh, when Don was brought in as an outside chair, was not a happy place, uh, to oh, say the least. <laughs> well, Don started turning things around, and speaking for myself here, I feel great gratitude for his support and leadership at a difficult professional time for me when I was a junior faculty member coming up for tenure. Uh, so that makes it even more of a pleasure to introduce them. Since then, Don has continued to serve the institution in many important ways, uh, most recently, a special advisor on race, Russia, yeah, excuse me, racial justice to President Frank. So I think I've given you at least an idea of his achievements. Tonight, he'll be speaking on his most recent book, Racism, Activism, and Integrity in College Football, the Ma Bates Must Play Movement. Thanks. Well, thanks so much. You really appreciate that. That was a great introduction. I wish I could live up to it. Uh, by the way, folks, everyone knows this will be Hugh Thomas's last year uh, with the uh, Humanities Center. Am I correct in that? You've done a great job. Thank you. I With this audience, we have quite a few administrators here. I look around and I see Guido and God, I see Robin and I see others who've had that that experience, uh, Herman, others as, as well, who've had that experience, good God. And only folks in administration who have done some administration know what's going on there. So let, let me go ahead and get to the real questions, right, the serious stuff. Did any of you see the Super Bowl game? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that was the best Super Bowl great, game yeah. I've ever, really ever seen. You know, it was, what, 38 to 35? And I was watching, I said, wow, it's absolutely in incredible. I saw the first one in 1967. Packers defeated the, uh, who was it, Kansas City Chiefs, right, in 67. So to watch this, absolutely incredible. And then I saw the uh, two quarterbacks. Patrick Mahomes and Jalen uh, Hurts, right? two black quarterbacks. And that made me have uh, travel down memory lane. I mean, way back memory lane. And, uh, to my freshman year, 
I mean, freshman year of high school, so <laughs> really way back memory lane. And I was uh, trying out for varsity football team. As a quarterback, I had a lot of audacity as a quarterback. And I can remember, I mean, my idol was uh, Y.A. Tittle and Johnny Unitas. I even had the high top shoes like Johnny U, uh, <laughs> et cetera. And I was third string quarterback, so I made the, the team. It was a senior and a junior uh, ahead of me, and I was number, number three. And we had a not very good year. And we were into our third or fourth game and playing our best game, actually. We were only losing six to zero <laughs> but going into the fourth quarter. And so we were on our 10 yard line and we had 90 yards to go. And there was some time left on the clock. And the coach had the audacity to say, Spivey, in at quarterback. Man must be crazy. <laughs> he knew I could throw. And it was like third and, I don't know, forever. I came into the game, threw the pass, et cetera. I don't know how the pass went. I mean, I never saw the pass. Any good quarterback, you got maybe two or three seconds before they knock you down, you know, uh, et cetera. And so you're laying on the ground and you're listening. Does that side of the uh, uh, stadium roar or your side of the stadium <laughs> roar? And it was our side of the stadium. And I found out later it was a great, great pass. I saw it later on film. Fantastic. And so we started moving the ball. That was a 30-yard pass. We started moving the ball, uh, et cetera. And I can recall that uh, uh, it was a, another long uh, period, third and 15 maybe or something like that. And one of the linebackers knocked the heck out of me. And the referee threw the flag. You know, it was offside. Right, 15 yards. I thought, oh, you could knock the heck out of me all the time. If it's, <laughs> you get those 15 yards more, uh, et cetera. And then a, another pass, uh, et cetera. When I was laying on the ground and I listened, well, and the, my side cheered. So it, that was great. And then we were finally down the three yard line, and I handed off to the fullback, and he scored. And it was six to six time. Right, Our field goal kicker who was not very good missed the field goal. But the game came to an end, and we had tied. The almighty team uh, that we were playing, uh, et cetera, Lakeview High School, uh, et cetera, and the game ended in a tie. My great comeuppance uh, was the following week uh, when the coach, he would maybe a, ga a game or two before the Next game, he would announce the starting lineup. And, and so I figured, well, you know, I'll still have my third place position. And he said, when he got to the quarterback spot, he said, quarterback, Spivey, kept going. So I had beat out the senior and the junior for that position and went on down the line and wow, okay. We played our next game, we won the next game, we did well, the remainder uh, of the season. In fact, we did fine the remainder of the season. Actually, we won every game, uh, et cetera. And yours truly uh, actually made the all-star team in Chicago. Don't, that's a big deal in Chicago, to make the all-star all -star team, uh, which I did, uh, et cetera. So they were very exciting for me. And I figured by the sophomore year, I was going to really rock and roll. And I remember the coach calling me in at the beginning of the sophomore year. And he said, I got to talk to you. I want to talk to you. And he sat down and I noticed the coach, Dave Zelensky. He had water in his eyes, I thought. He said, uh, you're playing great. You're doing great. He says, no question in my mind that you'll get a fellowship, a scholarship to any university in this country. No question about it. He said, but not as quarterback, because they don't, any of the major universities, want a Negro as quarterback. He said, I'm changing you, switching you to the running back position. I remember that was incredible for me to hear and to, to know that this was 
the case. To make a long story short, fast forward to the senior year, I did well, to say the least. I had 54 scholarships in my pocket, scholarship offers. Uh, and those offers had come, not because I was salutatorian or number two in my class, uh, not because I had good grades, not because my test scores were okay, etc. They come because I had speed and I could run a damn football. That's why they came. So when I'm looking at those two black quarterbacks who were able to play the position and do so well, it made me have this trip down memory lane. Now I've told you a story, and it's a true story. Uh, and my high school sweetheart could confirm that it's fairly accurate. My high school sweetheart is sitting right here, <laughs> right, and uh, et cetera, a renowned cookbook author. Uh, and this year we celebrate our 52nd wedding anniversary. So thank you, Diane. <laughs> right. I mentioned that story to you all so you know why this person. I was doing research in 1985. Uh, just doing research on the uh, black music scene, etc. And I came across a story about these students at New York University who were protesting uh, against ill treatment of a black athlete in 1940. The specifics of the, their protest was, uh, in fact, they were saying that uh, that uh, the, the New York University Violet, Violets were scheduled to play the University of Missouri Tigers uh, in Columbia, Missouri. And University of Missouri had invoked the Gentleman's Agreement, which was an agreement that uh, you leave your black athlete at home when you come and play in Columbia, Missouri. These students objected. To this, and you can see them there. Uh, the likeness of their protests in 1940. Right, if I, my pointer worked, I would show you that. Uh, uh, yeah. I can come over here. Everybody can hear me. Uh, this is uh, our guy Al Stout, who was the architect of the basement play movement. Uh, next to him is Naomi Bloom. Uh, that's uh, Mervyn Jones right there. And over here in the corner is uh, Evelyn Maysell Wicking. Oh, she was known as Evelyn Maysell back, back then. And they launched this protest demonstration, uh, et cetera, because they were opposed to what was happening uh, and what the university was bowing to this Jim Crowism. I knew we were going to have some problems with this. There we go. It worked that time. Oh, right. that was my finger. Oh, see there? <laughs> see? All right. Um, do I need to stand behind that mic? I don't think so. Yes. I do? Yeah. <laughs> They're sort of soft-spoken. Oh, OK. I could speak louder. That would be, be better. I can't see exactly what, what okay, I have there. OK, come on down. <laughs> you can also not take the mic out. Ah, that's better. Thank you. Right. I wanted to tell you about the, the, what this book does is give you a sense of how I unravel uh, this story. First of all, the searching for the base seven. Uh, you saw four of them listed uh, there, and I finally found the other, uh, other three, and it was a heck of a searching uh, process. So what I decided to do was to turn that it started in 85, and I, what was happening is 86, 87, I was writing. Uh, every year I would write a couple letters uh, to the uh, New York University Alumni Association asking if you can help me find these seven architectural students who put together this great protest demonstration. 
they were able to confirm that five of them had graduated uh, and two had not, uh, etc. These students who were suspended uh, obviously didn't have any love for the university uh, anymore. And so I said by about 87 after trying, uh, and I, that's all I learned and don't know where they're at, I better turn to the main character of this institution, of this uh, issue, and that was Lynn Bates. And I wrote to the Alumni Association, and they told me, in fact, Mr. Bates is still alive and well, living here in New York. And I had a great time interviewing uh, Lynn Bates uh, after we set it up on the phone, uh, et cetera. We had many discussions, and he took me back uh, and I'm glad, you know, one of the things we try and teach people who are doing oral histories is to identify as much as possible with those that you are interviewing. Certainly learn as much as you can about them, uh, et cetera. And the fact that I had played college ball also helped uh, with that interview uh, process. Of course, he, what he went through compared to what I went through was nothing uh, whatsoever. I want to give you a few samples from the book. So he talks about the self-made man and how he was a self-made man. One of the things he used to do is he worked at the Washington Market there in New York and he would make this eight mile run from his place there in Harlem, his apartment in Harlem, eight miles to the Washington market. And he started doing this when he was 12 years old. Uh, he was born in uh, 19, 1917, right? And he was doing this since he was 12 years old and getting gigs at the Washington Square Market, eight miles there and back. And, and what you get, what I try and do in studies, remember, he goes through the Depression era, right? So he sees Hoovervilles, uh, etc. Uh, understands what's going on there, to, to say the least. And we talked about this running that uh, he was into, and he said that was the greatest uh, thrill of his life. He enjoyed running. And, and he saved, as he told me, he saved the nickel that it would take to ride the bus or take the uh, elevated train, the subway, uh, etc. That, that nickel. And he would run. Eight miles there, which I said, well, if it's eight miles there, it's eight miles back. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, and I said, didn't the police stop you? Certainly as a kid growing up in Chicago, well, it wasn't a running so much as it was driving, the police would stop you. He said, yes, indeed. Just to give you a flavor of that, that chapter, here's what he says. And here's how I write it. Of those marvelous morning runs, he often talked to himself, sometimes out loud at the occasional, uh, loud uh, to the occasional strange glance of uh, one of the few people on the streets witnessing a fleet footed colored boy zooming along and engaged, and engaged in self conversation. A dozen times the police stopped him wanted to know what he was running from. He explained that he was not running from uh, anything and was running to his job at the Washington Market. Of course, any black person running down the street was deemed suspicious by the police, especially one zooming nonstop through a white area. They stopped blacks all the time for no reason whatsoever except their skin color. Black Harlemites, and people of color in American cities and towns throughout the nation knew well the game of cops and niggers, which could become deadly if you were not careful. Lenny's mother warned him often that his running to work could get him into trouble. She told him that when white folks see a black man in motion, the first thing they think is that he has committed the crime. If the police tell you to stop, she told her son, stop on a dime, and be polite to them and be sure to say yes, sir, and no, sir. Mother Bates did not want Lenny to become one of the many Negro accident victims at the hands of the police. 
when the game of cops and niggers went sour. Over time, police in the area grew to know the fleet-footed Negro boy by sight. And Lenny often waved at them, waved to them, and they waved back. Those are the kinds of insights that Lenny Bates, that Lenny Bates gave me, great insights. In making the team, as we talked about what he did in making the team, uh, Certainly, he secured that, that position when in the end of the day tryout, uh, they had a mile run. And needless to say, he won the mile run, uh, hands down, uh, he did. But he felt that the most telling moment in the tryouts was doing a two-on-one drill. And I told him, you know, we had the two-on-one drills even in my day, right? In the 1960s, we were still doing the two of ones at the University of Illinois in the Big Ten Conference, and I said it was that was a brutal, macho time. Two of ones, they would put a bag, a blocking bag, five feet apart, two bags, etc., and an offensive lineman and a defensive line, lineman would line up across one another, and the quarterback would stand back, and there would be a running back. And the goal was you had to take the ball, run through between the, the two bags, uh, et cetera. And the goal for the defensive player was to shed your blocker and knock the hell out of you. And your goal was to somehow gain, gain yards and hopefully you had a good blocker who tried to do his best. Uh, Lenny, and we talked about that for some time. This is what he shared with me. At his tryout uh, for the team at the NYU. Lenny had watched it enough to know what to do. When the quarterback called the snap count of Hup one, he shot forward to get the ball. The next thing he knew, he was flat on his back and the ball flying loose in the air. He could hear the coach yelling, fumble, fumble, get to it. Big Bernie dove on the ball. It was a shame for the running back and the blocker and the ultimate victory for the defensive player doing the drill to stop the play for no gain. In this case, the mountain man was playing against uh, uh, his uh, offensive player. The mountain man who jarred the ball loose and recovered the fumble. Uh, this was an exquisite play, a football acumen on his part. Big Bernie had instantly shed the offensive lineman's half-hearted block, and with him out of the way, unleashed his patented monster tackle on Lenny, hitting him head on with such intensity that it knocked Lenny backward just as he barely uh, touched the ball from his quarterback. The players moaned and groaned in response to the vicious thumping. Lenny, dazed and rising slowly to his feet, could feel a warm liquid spilling over his mouth and dripping uh, from his chin. He put his hand to it to wipe it off his face. The bright red color of the moisture shocked him. He had never bled before, not like this. His nose was bleeding and his upper lip busted. He had not tasted his own blood before. He looked over to Coach Stevens He looked up at the coach Stevens, uh, expecting some sign of sympathy. The coach stood with his hands folded and completely emotionless. There was no sympathy uh, coming his way. This was football. It was macho time. Either play or get off the gridiron. So those are the kinds of things that Lenny shared uh, with me. Uh, needless to say, he did make the team. If you want to read more of the details about it, you have to get the book. Uh, one of the other fascinating things after he made the team uh, are the games he played. Uh, I titled that chapter, Give the Nigger the Ball. And in fact, I thought for one point that might be the appropriate title for the entire book. 
which was next. <laughs> By the publisher, you can't use the N-word and those kinds of things and titles uh, anymore. Uh, can't use any kind of derogatory uh, language. But the, the, what he experienced on the field was incredible. I shared with him some of my experience uh, of playing, and his was, you know, I did it knowing that his was worse by far. In fact, I talked to him, I remember telling him, well, we had four blacks on our team. He said, really? He said, I was the only black person on my team. Wow, absolutely incredible. He said, did you ever experience any racial hostility? I said, really? Not, not so much. He said, for me, every play. And this is the kind of thing he shared with me. He said, and this is me speaking, for Lynn Bates, every single game was a nightmare of derogatory name calling, virulent racial epithets, and illegal blows and fouls that routinely went uncalled. I might add that he told me that at one point he was so beaten up in a game, he came home and his wife saw him and screamed. Uh, he said because he had so many scratches and bruises on him, etc. Some, either players or spectators, called him nigger almost every time he ran uh, with the ball, caught a pass, or made a good block. Quote, when you were on the field, you were a target, Bates recalled, end quote. And when you were off the field, you were still a target, end quote. Usually once or twice each game, he was hit with a stone or some other object thrown by a spectator. It was common to get spat on uh, when you were walking to and from the locker room, he told me. I got hit with a big glob of stuff one time that was so bad that I had to go back into the locker room to wash it off, my face and uniform. It stunk to high heavens. I think it was vomit that somebody heaved up in a bag and then saved it to throw on me. Can you imagine that? This is the kind of experience he was going through. One of the things you would, might ask is, why did it take me so long to do such a small book? And I must tell you that of all the projects, I, this one only recently finished uh, this one. And part of the problem was that I still need, after visiting uh, New York University and using their Bob's archives and uh, going to the Schomburg collection and going to the University of Missouri and using the, the city and state archives, etc., I had to find the Bates Seven. One of the things that, that fascinated me with my interviews with, with Mr. Bates which concluded in 80, I think 88, uh, et cetera, he got me to promise that when and if I found the base seven, right, and I told him I was still looking and trying. He said, when and if you find them, just tell him I said, thank you. And it was a heck of a challenge. I would write constantly uh, to uh, the Alumni Association at least two or three times a year of formal letters. Uh, usually, they sometimes they responded and they would always tell me no, or other times they didn't even bother to, to respond until 1998. <laughs> 1998. And I don't know the name of the person there in the NYU alumni office, but whoever this person was, they saved the date. And they took serious my asking, do you recognize any of these names, et cetera? And they could confirm that five of them graduated with NYU degrees, but no, none of the others, until this one person, whoever that person was, did the homework uh, and said there was a Dr. 
Evelyn Maisel Witkin, who came to the 50th anniversary of the 1941 graduating class, and she signed out. And this is nine years past that this person was looking back. I said, this person signed out. I said, are you kidding me? No, they said, no. If, if you want to try and contact us, they're absolutely right. I want to try and contact her. So uh, that evening, I drafted a letter, sent it off express mail uh, to them the next day, uh, et cetera, and they got the letter to Dr. Witkin. I, I, I sat there waiting in my home office by the phone, hoping to hear something. <laughs> and I remember the day the phone rang, and I looked over to my caller ID, and I could see the name Evelyn Witkin. And I was shocked by it. So shocked I almost forgot to answer the phone. <laughs> right? Finally, I picked it up, answered it. I said, Dr. Witkin, how are you? And she said, I'm fine, Professor Spivey. How are you? And we were only supposed to talk for 10 minutes. We ended up talking that first time for several hours. It was just like an old friend. And we arranged to set up. I would come to Princeton, New Jersey, where she lived, and come to condominium there, uh, et cetera, uh, to interview her, to tape her, uh, et cetera. And she, she, at the end of our conversation, she said, do you mind if uh, I bring a, a friend with me? I said, no, absolutely. Who's your friend? She said, Miss Jean uh, Bornstein, another one of the original of uh, Bait 7. So I was going to get the opportunity to meet two of the original Bait 7. Uh, so uh, indeed, when I got there uh, and rung the doorbell, it was absolutely uh, incredible. Dr. Evelyn Mesa Wick and uh, she, she demands that I call her Evelyn, uh, and Jean Borstein Asley demanded that I call her Jean. So I tried, and I still uh, try uh, to this, this day uh, to, to do that on a first name basis. But we had a marvelous time, and, and making that connection with them was so very uh, important because you know you can go all do all the formal research, but when you got the opportunity to do an oral study, an oral research, and to hear from actual participants in the event, it makes a heck of a difference. Not only that, they shared with me some of the original, original documents done by the students right, in the protest demonstration. And I have copies of all of them, uh, thanks, in fact, to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, 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 Jean Borston Azalea, Dr. Evelyn Maisel Witkin, uh, and, and to Dr. Robert Schoenfeld. I have all of them. In fact, the NYU alum, the uh, archives there, does not have uh, these documents, and I don't have to decide whether I'm going to give it to them <laughs> or not. But these are documents that tell you about what happened at the games. You can pick up other information from others. Uh, from sources, uh, et cetera. Uh, the NYU violence went ahead no matter what the students were doing. And we're talking about a massive protest that at one point had more than 2,000 students clamoring, Bates must play. Don't ban Bates. My favorite one, which obviously must have been uh, assigned to everybody, a history major. No Missouri Compromise, <laughs> uh, etc. But the team went anyhow, uh, and meeting them at the train station was a bunch of protesters, some 20 or 30 protesters. Bates must play. No Missouri Compromise. The team went, uh, and they lost big time uh, to the University of Missouri, 33 to nothing. And back on campus, many of the students were saying it must have been divine retribution, <laughs> uh, et cetera. The reality is Missouri had one heck of a team. And to beat Missouri, and those teams that were successful in trying to stop Missouri uh, did so by having an offense that kept their, their offense sitting on the bench. You didn't want them to come in and play because they had a very sophisticated offense and pass and attack. Uh, Etc. And I found that a number of the reports told the whole story. That early on, when the game was in, still 
debatable who could win this, this game. There would be a one yard needed uh, for a first down. Uh, and there would be great blocking up front, but the back carrying the ball was too slow to get there. And a number of people reported and said, this was Lynn Bates territory. He's fast, if we got there, if they had a chance, it was only with Lynn Bates. Despite the outcome of the game, right, and the drubbing uh, that the NYU Violets received, this did not end things. The administration thought it would end uh, the protests, and it didn't. No, the protests grew even more. Uh, thank goodness for these, these students. They were not satisfied with just the team losing uh, the game. In fact, it spread throughout uh, the university, uh, the protests, the demonstrations. They began to check on all uh, aspects of the NYU program and found that all the teams, track, uh, basketball, all followed Jim Crow, Jimmons agreements, uh, et cetera, and left their black players at home when any team they were facing in the South, of course, but any of the teams in the North who invoked the gentleman's agreement. Don't, Joe, don't Jim Crow, Jim Coward became a, one of their slogans later on as they continued to fight uh, in terms of trying to integrate uh, the uh, basketball program, trying to get rid of Jim Crow uh, in the basketball uh, program. This is one of the flyers they sent around, don't Jim Crow, Jim Coward, uh, et cetera, and the team was supposed to go uh, to Washington, D.C., which is really the South, uh, and Georgetown, Catholic University there, refused to play against a team that had a black on it. They invoked the gentleman's agreement. That's a shot of the NYU <coughs> Violets. I don't have to point out to you which one uh, is uh, Jim Coward. Uh, on the team. So the students spoke truth to power, but as I say in the book, power has a way of speaking back. And there's no question about it, the seven students were suspended, and they were suspended for the last three, four months uh, of their careers. Uh, and this really hurt a number. While they were still graduating, but you take, for example, someone like uh, Evelyn Mazo uh, back then. Uh, she would have been valedictorian. There's no question uh, about it. But she was denied that. She could get her degree, uh, but she was denied that because she had been a troublemaker, uh, etc. In fact, she lost her scholarship uh, that she was supposed to get to, to continue on in graduate school. But that's another story about how well she did in going to another, a different graduate school eventually. Uh, so you have these seven suspended students, and that did not end the efforts made uh, to correct, correct this problem. Uh, except that the, the students kept protesting. One of the, the protest leaders I think you'd be interested in is Bayard Rustin. He was, uh, in fact, the student in charge of the SUNY, City University of New York, efforts of Bates must play, uh, et cetera. And even his biographers miss, miss this, I have to tell them, that in fact, in, he hones his great skills uh, as a civil rights activist, starting with Bates must play. Right? You think of Bayard Rustin and the SCLC. Uh, he's the architect behind the march on Washington in 1963. But he hones his skills, and Bates must play. Also interesting about Bates Must Play, the students launch a sit-down demonstration, really angry about the suspension of the debate seven, uh, et cetera. And a sit-in demonstration, we think about sit-in demonstrations in the 1960s, Woolworth, and so forth, uh, all of that. Uh, and you can look at an earlier period, uh, 1934, Harlem Droughts for Negroes campaign, uh, 36, the, the sit-down strikes by automobile workers in Flint, Michigan, 
But the civil rights, it really begins in 41 with students at NYU striking over the suspension of debate seven. This is one of the songs they, they sung uh, during the sit-down demonstrations in uh, Dean McCombs' uh, outer office, the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences uh, there, etc., along with the uh, head of the uh, athletic program, uh, Badger, uh, what's his name, the head. This kind of sit-in uh, demonstrations. Uh, and what's so pleasing to me is I would get a re regular report uh, from um, Betty Bassler, uh, Bobby Bassler, who's a good friend of uh, Evelyn Whitkin there at Princeton. Uh, and Bassler, who's a great noted professor there at the Princeton University in molecular biology, in fact, she's chair of the department, she would go over seeing Evelyn and read her parts uh, of, of a book. Uh, Evelyn was doing just fine, but problems was with, with, with her eyes. Uh, and so <laughs> Betty would, uh, would, would uh, read her parts of the book. And she told me that when they got to why do we sit here on the floor, that Evelyn started singing with her and knew all, all the words. Seven students we suspended because they wanted Jim Crow ended. Uh, and they go on and they name the seven, Bornstein, Jones, Mesa, Bloom, Kreis, Krieger, uh, Schoenfeld, Stout. Why do we sit here on the floor? We will not tolerate Jim Crow here anymore. Right? The death of the gentleman's agreement in college athletics comes thanks to this first salvo other schools join in, Rutgers, Harvard University joins in, uh, et cetera, and they cite of what was happening at uh, NYU, and there's no question about it that this leads to a nationwide push to end Jim Crow and the gentleman's agreement in collegiate athletics. Now, some will tell you, well, it really ends in uh, maybe 66 with the Texas El Paso game where they played the University of Kentucky for the NC2A championship, uh, and they win. But <laughs> very often not mentioned is that uh, University, what becomes University of Texas El Paso, uh, that they has fielded an all-black starting lineup, and they beat the vaulted uh, Kentucky Wildcats, uh, et cetera, uh, and for the NC2A championship. And they won it because they were playing black style uh, basketball. Others will say, no, it really ends in 1970 when Bear Bryant, coach of the Crimson Tide, invites down USC to come down to Tuscaloosa uh, and, and play them uh, in a game. Uh, and USC runs all over Bear Bryant and the vaulted uh, Alabama Crimson uh, Tide. In fact, uh, much of that backfield is an all-black uh, backfield. Uh, and the running back, uh, by the name of uh, Sam Bam Cunningham, uh, the fullback, uh, had a glorious game, 135 yards, two touchdowns. Uh, one of uh, <laughs> the coaches, uh, Jim, uh, one of uh, Bill Bryant's uh, assistant coaches said, I think that indeed, Sam Bam Cunningham did more for integration and civil rights in uh, Alabama in one hour than Martin Luther King Jr. did in 20 years. There was a major letter writing campaign. You know, one of the reasons that Ellen Whitkin uh, had, in fact, uh, how are we doing for time? We should move on pretty soon now. Okay. Right. Yeah, one of the, I'll, I'll end it with this. One of the reasons uh, Evelyn Whitkins was at that 91, 1991, 50th anniversary reunion is she was still a troublemaker, <laughs> right? And she wanted the university to rescind what it had done to her and the group uh, and to apologize uh, for what it done, had done and that she and others 
were, were correct. I deal with this in 60 years left on the clock. Uh, and here at the University of Miami, we joined in the letter writing campaign. Robin might recall, she was a member. We had a, a center for research in sport and society here at the University of Miami. Uh, Joe Mills Braddock in sociology was the head of it. We had a lot of members uh, to it, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we joined in with that campaign. Uh, and we had an inside person, Dr. Jeffrey Sammons, uh, who was at NYU in the history department. He worked the inside track, we worked the outside track, and joined with Evelyn in this crusade. In the end, NYU said, in fact, uh, it would acknowledge these student heroes. Uh, and it would do so at a major event, a uh, sports event, more than 400 guests there. It would be dedicated to the students of the Bates Must Play movement and their great effort uh, to bring it in to the Jim Crow, uh, the gentleman's uh, agreement. But they quickly added, we will never apologize. We can't look back to what some of you did 60 years ago, uh, et cetera, until this. It was a front page story in the New York Times. Blasting, uh, it told the story of, uh, of the protest. NYU honors protesters it punished in 1941, All right? And that front page time, which came out the same day at the event, and I was getting called, heck, I was already there to, to, to see this uh, event. Uh, I was invited, Jeff Sammons was invited, and we had both agreed we stay out of the way, it's not our day, et cetera. And, and hear what uh, the real heroes have to say as the university honors them. But the New York Times has tremendous influence. It was fascinating of what happened uh, that evening. And this was the last point of the book. And uh, Bonnie Bessler told me that she read this to Evelyn, and I guess they both cried. This is the end of the book. When the host of the evening, Dr. Lynn Brown, took the stage and recounted the galleon's stand of the Bates Seven, the entire audience stood and applauded and paid homage to his pioneers in the struggle for civil rights. Dr. Brown, speaking on behalf of the administration, also did something else. After she predicted, pre presented uh, tokens of appreciation to the members of the Bay 7, she delivered an apology. She acknowledged on behalf of NYU that the Bay 7 had been right in their actions and that the university now apologized for its Jim Crow ways of the past. As members of the Bay 7 sat at the table, the massive audience all rose again and applauded the heroic trailblazers who led the way to end the gentlemen's agreement in college sport. A salute is also owed to New York University, which owned up to its past and embraced its former students who were for many years ahead of their university and the time in advancing the cause of civil rights. It was 60 years later but both could now honestly claim their commitment to moving forward in unison and a renewed commitment to building a more perfect union. Those are some shots from the banquet itself. Uh, and that's uh, standing there, Naomi Bloom. That's uh, Anita Krieger. That's Dr. Robert Schoenfeld. Uh, that's uh, Ms. Jean Borstein Azale, and that's Dr. Evelyn Maysell Whitkin. Evelyn <laughs> always was a, a source of inspiration and jokes. Uh, you will recall that earlier picture where they're sitting there. Right, and that's, that's her right there. And she said when she showed that picture, to her granddaughter when she was nine years old, her granddaughter was nine years old, her granddaughter said, oh, grandma, you used to be pretty. 
just like children. They can put you in your place in a heartbeat. Uh, and that's uh, Dr. Igal Stout, believe it or not. That's an interesting story of how we met Dr. Stout. You want to know about that? Get the book. That's Dr. <laughs> Jeffrey Sammons, who, who uh, retired this year at FIU, and that's yours, truly. The Times was supposed to follow up. We were going to have all these great stories uh, and so forth. The University of Miami did things. But note when this banquet was held, May 5th, 2001, there was a certain incident that happened, 9-11, that wiped all of that off the clock, so to speak. We have since reached out. This is Dr. Evelyn Maisel Whitkin receiving the National Medal of Science from then President George Bush to show you how fabulous uh, things turn out uh, for her. She's also received the Lasker Award, which is the award uh, in the sciences, uh, etc. I don't know anyone who received that award who didn't receive the Nobel Prize. She's been nominated several times for the Nobel Prize. We have made sure that uh, Bill Whitaker at 60 Minutes knows this story. We've also contacted uh, Brian Gumble at Real Sport to know this story because Dr. Mesa, Evelyn, every time you give her an award, she will tell you this. I feel that my greatest contribution was as a member of the Bates 7. What, what I was trying to do in the book is to make everything accessible for a general audience. Scholars who will get this book, well, it wasn't written for you scholars. <laughs> scholars can benefit from it and the issues discussed, but what we were trying to do was make it accessible, to reach out to a general audience. And I was very pleased that we could get the endorsement uh, of Harry Edwards. Some of you will recall Dr. Harry Edwards, who was the architect of the 68 Olympic boycott, right? Mexico City, and for years he taught at the University of California uh, at Berkeley. They had the most popular course there, his course on sport and race, which I understand had more than a thousand students. Each time he offered the course, no wonder when he retired, his chair was saying, hey, Harry, you want to come back and teach that course? <laughs> He caught the essence of what we were trying to do as he gives a blurb in the book. He says, as readable as a novel and often riveting, the revealing reprise of the saga of seven politically courageous and committed student activists, their contributions and their sacrifices decades before the 1960s is indispensable to a complete understanding of too often neglected developments in the revolution of sports activism in America. Thank you. So, Don, would you like to handle the questions? Oh, sure. Are there any questions? Well, Hugh, we have another uh, microphone. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the microphone around. Uh, so. Hey, how you doing? How are you? OK. Uh, I'd say if you, if you wouldn't mind, just so we can uh, get another recording. Okay. Um, obviously, the, the uh, Big Ten, during this period of time, uh, after, the Second, after the First World War, uh, was integrated um, from Jesse Owens to in, in exactly this period. Um, Bill Willis was an All-American at Ohio State. Um, so what was the difference? How did the gentlemen's agreement work? And was big, the Big Ten a part of it? Uh, were they honoring other schools that uh, had this kind of a requirement? And then making the, um, what you'd call the, the, um, uh, the gentlemen's agreement active, uh, just back and forth uh, between, um, uh, uh, between various conferences and that sort of thing. Iowa, for instance, uh, back in the uh, in the day, uh, had Duke Slater and some of these folks. In Minnesota. So could, yeah, could sure. you just address yeah. how it 
manifested itself among schools, big schools, that, uh, uh, that were in effect uh, um, set it, setting the stage for future integration. Yeah, I mean, the gentleman's agreement was never a written document. It was largely, you know, something, particularly the, the southern schools, almost all of them abided by it or invoked it, et cetera. But many of the northern schools would uh, as, as well uh, abided by the, the gentleman's agreement. But many of the northern schools would finally take issue with it and fight against it. You mentioned uh, some, but Wisconsin would, and very drawn out fights with uh, institutions, particularly like University of Missouri, uh, et cetera, and they would refuse finally to play them any further. And as this whole momentum grew, to have a greater and greater consciousness uh, to integrate, to have interracial sporting uh, events, it would finally take hold nationally. Uh, Etc. But yeah, it was never a our conference versus their conference. It was always school versus school. The North Carolinas, for example, the Missouri, the South Carolinas, uh, Georgetown for the longest practiced the gentleman's uh, uh, agreement. So this is so inspiring. Thank you so much for doing this work. Um, I'm an artist, but a uh, a retired athlete. No, um, I have a million questions, so I'm gonna try to think about one specific one. Uh, I may have, I walked in a little late. I apologize. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why it was mostly women that were in the big seven. Uh, and I mean, it appears oh, sure. that way. Maybe I'm misreading the information, no, um, really and that seems uh, unusual because they're fighting, I guess, for men to. Play. So if you could just kind of go yeah, into the dynamics historically, um, as I imagine, you know, Title IX and all these fun things that came later had not uh, been part of the landscape then, but if you could just kind of expand on, you know, was this kind of like the civil rights cheerleader kind of, you know. But, but women have them. always been at the forefront of the yes. civil rights movement. <laughs> I mean, you know, I teach a course on the civil rights movement. They never got their due, but when you look at the foot soldiers, who were they? I mean, talk about uh, the back up and talk about uh, the uh, Harlem uh, Jobs for Negroes campaign that Adam Clayton Powell Jr. led. All of his foot soldiers were women They're from the Abyssinian Baptist Church. They were, they were women. And the same holds true for the civil rights movement of the 60s. Uh, one of the, the great ironies is women never got their due because the civil rights movement, much of its leadership, were male chauvinists. No question about it, uh, etc. And so if you're a smart woman like a Ella Baker, who's intelligent, smart, outspoken, etc., uh, you won't find a lot of people who loved her, the male uh, leadership. I, I think they were afraid of her, uh, etc., because she wouldn't keep quiet. She, talk, she speak her mind, and when you look at the details, she was correct. She was right, etc. So there is this, this ongoing issue there about women and their involvement. When I talked to uh, Dr. Evelyn uh, Maso of Whitkin, who was doing fine, folks, at 102 years of age, I've got her recorded here on my phone, I wanted to hear, because I, well, when I wanted to report to her, I was fixing to give a, uh, a book sign, uh, etc., but I missed her, so she called me back, and I had to take um, She sounds the same as she sounded in the 1990s. Strong, etc., feisty, absolutely, uh, you know, uh, incredible. And, you know, her area is genetic science, and you see, you know, we've asked her, you, know, you want to tell us what the secret is? You got a secret <laughs> formula, etc. You're doing fine at 102. March 9th, she'll be 102. She's just 101 <laughs> uh, right now. But, but yeah, these, these discrepancies. And when you talk to these women like Jean Borstein Asile, uh, etc., who've been involved in women's studies, uh, etc., I think she passed away at age 
86, uh, et, et cetera. I interviewed all the Bates seven except one, uh, and that was Mervyn Jones, who was a famous author. He became a famous author uh, in Britain, lived back in Britain. I think he wrote 29 books, uh, et, et cetera. Mervyn Jones, I, that's the only one I didn't interview because he was ill uh, and couldn't attend even the, the banquet given. But, you know, there's always been that failure to recognize the importance of women. Here's another demonstration. Women are the leaders, and Bates must play. It, it tells us, again, the story that the scholar has to be open to all sources. I don't care what the sources are. You should, you should embrace all sources, written, oral, music, art, whatever you can get your hands on that helps give you some insight uh, into the times and the period uh, and the thinking. And that's exactly what I did. The way I teach a course, the same way. I say use whatever you can find to help bring the subject to life. So. Any other questions? Well, if not, uh, let's uh, please join me in giving a well round of applause.